Good afternoon. I'm Tom Butcher of the Zero Project, and I have the honor of being here today with Professor Yelon Shamovitz from Israel. If I may call you Shira. Absolutely. Shira is Dean of Students at Ono Academic College and actually head of Ono Center for Academic Equality and Inclusion. And before we address our really quite difficult subject, which is, is long COVID a disability? I asked Shira earlier whether she'd just give her a us a few words on Ono Academic College. Shira. Sure. Uh, Ono Academic College is the largest uh, private college in Israel with over 20,000 students. Um, I'm the Dean of Student there, but one of the things I'm most proud of is that I'm also the head of the Israeli Institute on Cognitive Accessibility, which is um, a joint um, initiative of Ono Academic College and uh, an NGO called uh, Agudat Ami. And there I've been working for over 20 years, I would say, on cognitive accessibility. Wow, thank you so much. That's, that's, that, that's, that's quite a CV, as they say. So let's hit our first question. Um, today, what I'd like to do is, is ask you to help us explore deeper the ideas about long COVID being a disability. And first, if you could tell us a little bit about your experience as a long COVID survivor, and then perhaps describe which types of accommodations you have made in your personal and professional life to accommodate the disabling effects of long COVID? Sure. Um, I think before I get into long COVID and my experience yeah. with it, it's important to just remind ourselves that COVID-19 has been the largest uh, plague to affect globally. Mm. Um, COVID uh, affected more than 650 million people around the world, um, with almost six and a half people dead, and about 10 to 40 percent, the estimates are, are changing, but even if we take the, the least estimate of 10 percent of people uh, experiencing long COVID, which refers to symptoms, prolonged symptoms. Yeah. Um, from It could be from 12 weeks up to a year or two. Uh, I mean, I've been there for almost over two years with that. Yeah. Um, so going back to, to my experience yeah. with COVID, I had um, COVID in September uh, 2020. Mm -hmm. I was considered recovered, supposedly, sure. yep. by October 2020. And I have been struggling with many different difficulties since, since then. Yeah. Um, went through a year and a half long rehabilitation process. And um, I would say my major um, symptoms were debilitating fatigue and a lot of cognitive issues. That was the main, the main thing for me. Um, now, when I talk about cognitive issues, I talk about memory, I talk about uh, concentration, I talk about the ability to be doing multitasking. If you think about, I mean, you listed the, the things that I do. Yeah. Um, they take a lot of cognitive effort. Mm. This, is, this is my main uh, forte, so to yeah. speak. And as an expert on cognitive accessibility, developing various cognitive accommodations, I never thought I would be requiring such yeah. accommodations, such cognitive ramps, as I, as I term them. Um, would you like some example of the accommodations that I'm using? Yes, just one or two would be okay. lovely, thanks. Sure. So some of these accommodations would include um, a lot of different um, memory um, signs, yep. so to speak. Um, even for this talk today, mm. uh, I have here, as you can see, a whole transcript of my answers. Mm. That is something I would never have to do yeah. before, before COVID. I would just have bullet points and just talk freely. Now I have to really do everything to make sure that I can, that I can go through it. Um, other things would be um, in my professional life. Lucky, I'm really, really consider myself lucky because I work at Ono Academic College, which is a, a very accommodating in, uh, academic institute. Yeah. 
So around April 2020, I came to my CEO and I said, listen, if I'm to keep doing my work, yeah. I need a personal assistant because yeah. I'm not managing. So I had one um, uh, allocated to me yeah. and I've been working with her ever since. Um, I also went down on some of my workload because yeah. of, the, of the fatigue. Yeah. Um, luckily, I have great staff, so I could delegate <laughs> and have people still do, still do the job well. You're very lucky. Very lucky. Yeah. But there are so many people who aren't that lucky. Yeah. yeah. And that, that will bring us on to the next question, which I... Um, looking at the, U the US, mm -hmm. and uh, you might not know from my accent that I live in the US. <laughs> so in the US, uh, our President Biden has declared that the condition of long COVID can meet the federal definition of disability. And this allows survivors to become eligible for certain disability civil rights protections along with disability benefits. Given we are now seeing this mass disabling condition unfold really across the globe, what do society, and by that I mean governments, companies, entities, need to do to ensure that we are best supporting those individuals who are now disabled, using that term judiciously, as a result of long COVID? I think that is one of the major questions. Um, Perhaps the first thing to realize is that we actually have to acknowledge long COVID. We have to acknowledge people experiencing all these different symptoms because a lot of them go unnoticed. Mm -hmm. Not only that, there's a lot of gaslighting going on when it comes to long COVID. Um, just the other day on my way here, mm -hmm. I met a woman on the plane. Now, I usually don't talk to strangers. <laughs> Actually, when I told my husband that, he said, what did you do to my wife? <laughs> What's going on here? But she heard me talk to someone. I'm on my way to the conference, yeah. and she asked about the conference. And when I told her what I'm going to be talking about, started asking all these questions. Now, she like, has a major position in some pharma company. And she said, you know what? I've been experiencing memory issues and concentration. I haven't been able to do all the things that I need to do. And everybody keep telling me, well, maybe it's menopause. Um, and, I, and, and I know that it isn't because it happened after I had COVID. So I told her I experienced the same thing, except not with menopause. People <laughs> just tell me maybe it's aging. I said, yeah, well, aging doesn't happen overnight. No. And the thing is, I'm, her and me, we're not alone in that. There are so many people that don't understand what's going on with them. Yep. And unless governments recognize, it's the government, it's the policy makers, recognize that long COVID is a disabling condition, yep. we cannot offer these uh, people any support. Um, now, I know it's a little tricky mm. because the definition is not uh, completely clear. Yeah. There are different definitions. The World Health Organization uses one. The ADA uses another. There are many different definitions. But the major thing, I think, is realizing that um, people need to be acknowledged about it. Mm. And the medical establishment, that is a big issue, need to, need to know that that actually exists and need to direct people towards rehabilitation and, and other accommodations. Right. Thank you. Which brings us, you know, let's, let's look at things on a practical basis. We're mm -hmm. here at the um, Zero Project Conference. So, with so many disability NGOs all around us here, what would be, I'm going to say, two recommendations you would have to give them about how we and NGOs in each of our countries best recognize and support this new, and I, it's horrid to have to say it, growing, growing segment of the disability community. Well, first of all, I have to agree that it is a growing disability. Mm. Um, I think for NGOs, I would say be proactive about it. Yeah. Don't just wait because people who, who experience long COVID don't necessarily know that that's what they're going through. And most of them, it's their first um, experience with a disabling uh, situation for many of the people experiencing this. 
and a lot of them don't know uh, who to approach, what their rights are, wh yeah. where to go, they have no idea. And so I think if NGOs would actually um, be proactive, yeah. take initiative, call people with long COVID, tell them, listen, there are things that you are entitled to by right. Don't be embarrassed. Yeah. You can come out with that. Yes. I mean, within the disability field, we've been struggling with, with uh, the ability to come and say, I have this condition. This is what I yeah. need. These are the yeah. accommodations I need. Most of the people with long COVID are not there yet. And no. I think that's the, the NGOs. It's on the un NGOs to bring them there. Yeah, and it's getting them there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, one final question before we wrap up, which is, what do you wish people knew about long COVID? And what is getting missed in the global conversation around it? I would say that the most crucial thing about it is that it actually exists. Yeah that it's here to stay at least in the foreseeable future. Mm. And therefore, we need to acknowledge it. We need to, to make people aware, not just the people themselves, the medical establishment, um, the NGOs, as yeah. you said before. I think that is the key um, issue, yeah. to have people less embarrassed about it, because yes. it's not easy to come and say, in my yeah. example, for example, yeah. something happened to my brain. I'm not sure what it is, but something yeah. happened here. Yeah. That was not an easy thing to, to come out and do, but I think it's crucial for society not to lose so many people. As yeah. I said, I was lucky, but there are many people losing their jobs. Yeah not being able to support themselves. Yeah. And that is not something we would like happening. No, absolutely not. And so I have one last question. Mm -hmm. This is what we would like. What would you tell people? Just one thing to tell them. Don't be ashamed. Make sure you, you go with what you are feeling. If somebody tells you, oh, maybe it's because of something else, if you feel inside that you're not you anymore, something had changed, trust your feeling, go with it, and insist on getting the accommodations that you need and the rehabilitation that you need, because nobody else is going to do it for you. Great. Shira? Thank you so much. It's been a real honor to be with you. And what sage advice, really not just for long COVID sufferers, but from absolutely everybody. Thank you very Goodbye much. Goodbye from us this afternoon. Thank you very much indeed for listening. It was a great session. <laughs>